Good evening, everyone. Good Good to see you all. Pray and begin. Father, we thank you and we praise you for another time, which means it's another day that we are alive, another day where we can bless you and magnify you and praise you in all that we do. Thank you for the Spirit of God being an ever-present force and help in our lives. We thank you that he is always with us. Therefore, we know you are always with us because where your Spirit is present, Father, there you are present. So Holy Spirit, as always, think through my mind, speak through my lips, the Word of God. May it go forth with precision, with clarity, so that knowledge and understanding can be increased. Knowledge and understanding of the word is knowledge and understanding of you, Father. And Holy Spirit, I know you'll see to it that the word goes forth effectively without any hindrance from the forces of darkness because the forces of darkness have been defeated and they were defeated at Calvary. And at Calvary, Christ said it is finished. And that finished work is what we've entered into, Father, and that is your rest. And where your rest is, is everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness. It is where we remain. So your peace, your love, your joy, your trust, your grace, everything that we need, we find in you. You are Jehovah Shalom, our peace, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider, and Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. You have healed us from all sickness and disease. You have healed us spiritually, soulishly, and physically. It's simply up to us to articulate that based on what your word says, to claim what is ours, what's already been purchased as a result of your blood by faith. And that includes our provision, every need in our life being met. And our peace, your shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken, wholeness, walking in the fullness of your blessing. We thank you for it. And the fullness of your blessing includes everything that we have said. That's what it truly means to walk in your blessing. And so we're thankful for it. We intend to receive the word this evening. We intend to grow. The seed will be planted into our hearts. I declare these are hearts of good ground. And it will produce in our lives. And it will be noticeable. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. Let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Let's let's talk Christmas in January. Christmas actually ended January 6th. Twelve days of Christmas actually begin on Christmas Day, December 25th, and they go through January 6th with what's called Epiphany from Christmas to Epiphany make up the 12 days of Christmas. So Christmas actually came to a close earlier this month, not too long ago. So we're somewhat still in the season, but of course this kind of subject matter goes beyond the holidays in which we're discussing. And so I believe this is going to be our favorite part. Let's get into it. What we're going to do tonight, we're just going to simply read Luke's account and Matthew's account not going to get too deep. We're not going to look into the history or any of the potentially pagan aspects. Right now, we just want to look at the birth of our Savior because, in fact, our Savior was born. For our Savior to have died, he had to first be born. You got it. And so, of course, Christmas, again, there's, there, there's no command a requirement in the gospel or in the New Testament to celebrate Christmas. It didn't even exist. Uh, The the certain particular church fathers made it a a tradition. And as I have said before, I don't see anything harmful with the tradition. To me, it's one of those traditions. Why not? Why wouldn't we partake in it? but it's, it's not something that you, you have to do. You don't have to do it. Uh, there's, there's no day in the New Testament under the new banner that you must partake in. 
Jesus is our, again, our high day. He is our holy day. He is our high holy day. He's fulfilled it all. Luke 1, 1 reads, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those, just as those, just as those who from the beginning were what? They were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. This is the gospel according to Luke. What is Luke telling us in these first two verses? Again, look at verse 1. And as much as many have taken in hand, in as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning, well, why doesn't he say just as us from the beginning? Luke says just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. So he makes the distinction between those and us. And apparently, thus far, Luke is not an us. I mean, Luke, I mean, Luke is not a those. He's an us. Again, he doesn't say, just as us who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. He says, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them. Delivered what to us? What's the them? Luke is saying, those who were at the beginning delivered these things to us. Which things? Is he referring to the narrative of those things that he mentions in verse 1? Look at verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent, Theophilus. Theophilus in the Greek means friend of God. If you notice, this introduction is very similar to the Acts introduction, who or which was also written by who? Our beloved physician, Luke. Theophilus is the person to whom Luke addresses his gospel account as well as the book of Acts. And then he says in verse 4, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. What is Luke telling us? He wasn't there at the beginning. He said those who were at the beginning, who were eyewitnesses and ministers, they delivered them to us. So Luke's account is a credible account from credible sources who were there or who were witnesses. Verse 5. And mind you, Luke, Lucas, right? We know Lucas. Lucas is, is Latin, but the Lau, L O U K A K A S. Uh, Lucan, he's also known as, but Laucus, Greek. His, his audience is, is the Greek audience, specifically the Greek audience. Verse 5. And that's going to be very important to remember when we start when we start attempting to pinpoint potential months and windows as to when our Savior was born. Because we know he was born. When? Well, I propose three months. December being one of them. And we'll see over time. Verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. Sounds weird. When you know that Herod is an Edomite. He should be a... Shouldn't he be the king of some Edomite land? But he's the king of Judea. Placed there by Rome. This is a certain priest named Zacharias. These are some, some very important... Nuggets to pay attention to. A certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. 
What's his name? He, he, and he's a what? He's a priest of which division? Abaya. Abijah. That division we need to remember. Let's not forget that division because we're going to have to circle back to it at some point in this lesson. It says his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. Which Aaron? The Aaron. The Levite. The, the, the origin of, of the priesthood amongst the 12 tribes. The, the Levitical priesthood. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron. And her name was what? Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Now, what does that mean? Because Jesus hasn't died. He's not even born yet, let alone died. So how can they be righteous? See, when we read this, we have to understand what we're reading. This righteousness, this is not our righteousness. Our righteousness is, I hate to be the one to brag, but it's better on this side of the cross. We are the declared righteous. We are the righteousness of God. Here it says, though, they were both righteous before God. Why were they righteous before God? Well, because they walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. But wait a minute, they had a sinful nature. So, so this righteousness clearly was accounted to them or credited to them, very similar to Abraham. Remember Genesis 15, 6? Abraham believed God. And God accounted it to him for righteousness. And so this righteousness that we're reading about here, because this is still Old Testament. The New Testament is not in effect. It's not in force yet. Because the Testament has no force or power until the testator dies. So Jesus' earthly ministry and his New Testament message was preached under the banner of the Old Covenant. The Mosaic Law was still in operation. So, even though Elizabeth and Zacharias were, were walking in all the commandments, and I have to add this, because it doesn't take away from the scripture, to the best of their ability, and ordinances of the Lord, to the best of their ability, God credited to them or accounted righteousness to them. You also see this word blameless. When we see this word blameless, what does this mean? Because etymologically, do you know what blameless means? Without blame. Without blame. It, <laughs> unblameable. In, in some ways, it means perfect. Well, now, we know no one's perfect, and we know no one's flawless. The word blameless in 1 Timothy chapter 3, when the Bible says that a he who desires the office of a bishop or the one who desires the office of a bishop must be blameless. They must be above reproach. Again, not flawless because no one can meet that. No one can do that. Really, here's what I believe. I believe the way we understand blameless biblically is Paul's words to Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, he talks about the qualifications of the bishop, of the pastor. And he says that one must be blameless. And then he lists these other things that this pastor must meet, these requirements that this pastor or whoever is called to the office of, of pastor by the Lord Jesus, who, whoever has accepted that calling and, and desires to do what the Lord has called them to do, they must be blameless. You know, husband of one wife. Their children must be in order. They must not be greedy for gain. They must not be what? Given to wine, meaning they're wine bibbers or drunkards. They must not be these things. But that word blameless, again, etymologically, when you look at synonyms for blameless, you get words that a human can't, we can't meet, we can't meet that, we can't measure up to that. So I believe that what Paul specifically is talking about is what he mentions two chapters later to Timothy. And I believe it's applicable wherever we see this word blameless, right? <laughs> Unless we're referring to Jesus, who truly is blameless. But, but Paul writes to to Timothy, and he says this in chapter 5, in talking about the pastors, bishops, or elders who 
persist in sin. Not the ones who've erred, because everyone errs, everyone misses the mark. He says, but the ones who persist in sin, or what? Sin and then continue in sin. He said, rebuke them. And so I believe that that is what we're, 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 we're reading in the New Testament when we see this word blameless. We are not of those who continue in it. We're not of those who persist in sin. Because we can't meet perfect. In our flesh, we cannot be flawless. We can't. But, but, but we can live a life above reproach. We can live a life of, of, again, led by the Spirit, consistency and in, in purity in that which is right. We'll drop the ball occasionally because of the flesh. The Bible says, he who says he has no sin deceives himself. And we make God a liar. There's sin in the flesh alone. So I believe blameless has to do more with not persisting in sin. True believers can't persist in sin anyway. We can't persist in it without the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. We, we, we just, we don't, I don't feel right. I need to be cleansed. This behavior, this old manner of doing things brings about a, a feeling of filth. I don't like this feeling. That's our new nature. Praise God for that. I believe that's what. And then think about this. We're talking about, now that's Paul writing to Timothy after Calvary. He's writing to someone with a new nature. They don't have the nature. Zacchaeus and Elizabeth don't have the nature we have. They don't have the nature. They didn't have the nature that Paul had, that Timothy had. So, so how blameless could they be to the best of their ability? To the best of their ability. Being righteous and, and committing. You see, watch this. Righteousness under the old covenant wasn't based on a man like it is under the new covenant. So it had to be based on commitment to ordinances, commandments, statutes, laws. Now, we all know not a one could keep them all. But clearly there were those who set their heart towards keeping them all. And that's an Elizabeth. And that's a Zacharias. Verse 7. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. We've seen this before in Scripture, haven't we? And why do you think so many of the matriarchs were barren? I have my own personal opinion about it. I mean, the devil hates the womb. How, how, how many... How many vessels of power have come from the womb of a woman going back to, to the ancient days of Scripture? The devil's done everything in his power. To, he was so happy sin came into the world. Oh, man, it's going to mess up a whole lot of stuff. It's going to interfere with a whole lot of stuff. They were both well advanced in years. Verse 8, so it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the what? Order of his division. We know what division that was based on verse 5. So remember, we want to hold fast to that because we're going to circle back to this. I'm going to highlight all the things we're going to circle back to. It says, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot failed to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name Yoan or John. And, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. What strong drink if it's not wine? Well, clearly, 
not all intoxicating beverages are wine, right? So he will not, he, he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Wait a minute, what does that mean? What does that mean? How can you be filled with the Spirit if you're not spiritually alive? Say it again, my brother. Spirit upon you. Spirit upon. Let me throw a couple of, a couple of examples. Because you and I are filled with the Spirit. We qualify to be filled with the Spirit because we've been born of the Spirit. Remember what Jesus said, the Spirit of truth whom the world can't receive. The world can't receive the Spirit of truth because they neither see him nor know him. He wasn't talking about salvation, was he? Because if he was talking about salvation, then the world can't get saved. So clearly he was talking about being filled with the Spirit. The world cannot be filled with the Spirit. Spiritually dead individuals cannot be filled. They could be born of the Spirit, meaning they could be saved. And then once you're saved, you are now positioned to be filled with the Spirit. And you and I, under the New Testament, those of us who have been filled with the Spirit, we have the Spirit in us at all times. He doesn't depart. He doesn't lift. So, as my dear brother said, this has to refer to the Spirit upon. Now, let me give you some things to chew on. I believe it's Exodus 28 and Exodus 31. The Bible tells us that artisans, masons, builders, the Bible says the spirit of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom filled them. It says they were, they were filled with the spirit of the Lord, specifically filled with the spirit of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom for the work of the building. The Bible also tells us that the spirit of the Lord would descend upon Samson when he would do a great feat. But again, these are spiritually dead individuals. So the Holy Spirit can't stay upon them. The Holy Spirit can't live on the, he can live on the inside of us. He can't live or stay in or on them. Couldn't live, and the Bible even tells us when it came to Samson, how the Spirit lifted. Okay? Now here we, have, here we have a John the Baptist. This is very unique in that the scripture says he'll be filled with the Spirit even from his mother's womb. Now we've all been able to explain how one already born can have the Spirit come upon him. How do you have the Spirit on you in the womb? Any theories? Have I shared my theory with you on this? Want to hear my theory? You sure? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say this part, and I have a feeling some of you are already going to figure it out. But John the Baptist came in the spirit of who? Elijah. And we have no record of the spirit of God lifting from Elijah before his departure into heaven. Then here comes John the Baptist coming in the spirit of Elijah. Not reincarnation. He wasn't, he wasn't reincar he's not a reincarnated Elijah, but he came in the spirit of Elijah. And I believe because he came in the spirit of Elijah, this is my only theory, because I don't have anything else. This is how the spirit could be upon him in the womb of Elizabeth. It's the only thing that makes sense to me when you're trying to make sense of things that are beyond your senses, <laughs> that go beyond your intellect. There could be another reason, and that's because God is God. That could be a reason, too. But we know God is orderly. He's real, he's, he's specific, he's meticulous, and everything he does is by way of legality. Now, that could be a legal way by which the Spirit could be on him in the womb before, he even, before his feet touch the earth in the womb because he's coming in the spirit of one who had the Spirit on him when he departed. Running theory. It says, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the, oh, there it is, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. 
bro, why don't you just say she's an old woman? Hey, I, don't, I don't get it. Why, 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 do you, why do I have to be politically correct with the wife? I'm an old man. She's an old woman. And the angel answered and said to him, oh, this is a powerful statement. Oh, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. What does that tell us about Gabriel? Oh, man, Gabriel, Gabriel, Gabriel's a bad somebody. Gabriel's a chief. Because I don't believe, based on my study of angels over the past 20 years, I don't believe every angel is authorized to stand in the presence of the Lord. Remember, we already know, based on Revelation, Michael has angels under his authority. Michael, submitted to the authority of God, has angels under his authority. Who gave Michael those angels to be under his authority? God did, which means God gave Michael a degree or measure of authority. Could we say the same about Gabriel? Even though we can't find anywhere in Scripture where Gabriel has angels, I think it's safe to assume Gabriel has angels. Why? Because Gabriel is a messenger angel, and there are other angels in Scripture not named Gabriel that deliver messages. Could we deduce safely, maybe, that Gabriel is chief of the messenger angels? I think we can. One thing for sure, this man Gabriel, as Daniel refers to him, Ishim, man-like, has the authority and privilege to do what? Stand in the presence of God. He says, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Whoa. Here's the consequence for unbelief. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was as soon as the days of his service were completed that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months. She hid herself five months, saying what? Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Now look at verse 26. Another nugget to grab a hold of. Now in the sixth month. And that's not talking about the month of June. In the sixth month. I'm not going to elaborate much right now. But take a note here. Just like that order of Abijah. Take note of this sixth month. This is important. It says, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Isaiah prophesies about the virgin. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. Highly favored one. Not just favored one, but highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Why is she blessed among women? We'll find out in just a second. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. So Gabriel's delivered, delivered a very important message to Zacharias. And he's delivering a much more important message to the virgin, Mary. Verse 30, then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth the son and shall call his name Jesus. Yeshua. Jehovah is salvation. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. 
Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? She was betrothed to who? To Joseph. And when you're betrothed, it's like you're married, but you ain't married. You're not married yet. In most cases, the betrothed would remain under the roof of her father until the wedding. Therefore, she would still carry the name of her father until that wedding, until that union. She says, how can this be? I don't know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that holy one who is to be born will be called the son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth. Why is he bringing Elizabeth up? Well, I mean, we know why, but... but she doesn't know why as of yet. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the what? So one thing we know for sure is in earth years, John the Baptist. Well, well wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Not only is John the Baptist six years older than Jesus. I mean, six months, six months older than Jesus. But if Elizabeth is Mary's relative, then I mean, by way of union, we, we have we have family here, don't we? Okay. I mean, I have cousins. That, were, that are my cousins now by way of marriage. They're blood cousins to my wife, but by marriage. And, and, and marriage to my wife means this woman's closer to me than, than the bloodline she came from. And, and right now, there's a cousin. Basically, I've taken this cousin from, from my wife, and he is now my cousin. He's so my cousin, even though he's my cousin by marriage, that the story I tell is that he's Angel's cousin by marriage because that's how close we are. I literally, I tell Angel all the time, you know, this is my cousin now. The only reason he's your cousin is because you're married to me. That's not technically right because before I showed up, they were already cousins. But that's, that is what the oneness of family is supposed to be because that's what the oneness of marriage is. Is supposed to be. It says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I believe this is when she became pregnant. Notice the difference between Zacharias and Mary. Zacharias now has to deal with being mute for a time because of unbelief. What did Mary say? Oh, this is what God said? According to your word, let it, let it be. According to your word, so be it. And I believe that's when it happened. Verse 39. It says, Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was, well, look at this. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Elizabeth. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit because of the baby in her womb who was filled, who had the Spirit upon him. It says, this she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the 
floor. Just how powerful is that? That Jesus is near John, both in wombs, and he leaps. What kind of power is that? Verse 46, and Mary said, but this is actually a song. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. And some have taken it a bit too far, haven't they? For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, not her name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. Well, three more months after six months would be nine months. Time for John to show up, right? And here we have verse 57. Now, Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth the son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. Now, again, the angel Gabriel said, blessed are you among women. That didn't mean venerator. That didn't mean pray to her. That didn't mean worshiper. That didn't mean she's now dubbed the queen of heaven. Praise God for the woman who carried the savior of the world. She found favor in the sight of the Lord. But there is nothing in scripture that points to us honoring her in any way almost equal to God or Jesus and that she's more than any other patriarch or matriarch in Scripture. It's not in the Bible. But again, you can see how the traditions of men can interfere with the Word. In addition to the traditions of men, uh, you know, I think I've left Catholicism alone for quite some time now, right? I've been nice. But and someone's asked me to do this, this treaties on Catholicism. I, mean, I can literally show you how, and remember, you have to remember what Constantine, first remember why he converted, and then what he allowed when he converted. He allowed a mingling of the pagan ways with the Christian ways. And, and as a result of that, suddenly now the now the God of this has become the saint of this. Look up the priestesses of the Roman goddess Vesta, the Vestal Virgins, and tell me if they don't look like nuns to you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop right there because I don't want to go too far into Because people, you know, Catholicism is precious to people. And bless their souls, it's precious to them because it's what they were raised in. And it's not necessarily that they're so committed to it, but it's all they know. And then it feels like it's an attack against their faith. But again, if Catholics believe in the Lord Jesus, then, then what does his word say about all of these other practices and and traditions and rituals. That's the thing about Christ freed us from the rituals. No more ritualistic requirements. Okay, anyway, 59. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child. Where have I heard this before? Abraham, maybe, when Isaac was born. Isaac was circumcised on day eight. Everybody else older was also circumcised on Isaac's day eight. Lord, Jesus. Um, It is not the will of God for males to remember their day of circumcision. I'm not supposed to remember. If I got circumcised at 13, I'm going to remember that. If I got circumcised at 72, I'm going to remember that. 
And everyone in Abraham, God said, everybody in your house. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and, and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. His mother answered and said, no, he shall be called John. But they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who was called by this name. So they made signs to his father that he would have him called. So this kind of helps us understand this tradition of patriarchs a generation or two later having a grandson or a great-grandson or a great-grandson with their name. Look, they said to her, well, wait a minute, why is that his name? There's no one among your relatives who's called by that name. All right, verse 63. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, his name is John. So they all marveled. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, praising God. Then fear came on all who dwelt around them, and all these sayings were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts, saying, What kind of child would this be? And the hand of the Lord was with them. Now, his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, All right, so we got Zacharias filled. We got John filled in the womb of Elizabeth. He leaps and she's filled. Once again, what are we looking at? The Spirit of the Lord upon. The Spirit of the Lord upon. The, the Holy Spirit, again, cannot live in a house or a tent where a spirit is unregenerate, can't dwell there. See, the Spirit of God descended on Jesus but could stay with Jesus. Why? Well, Jesus, number one, he wasn't born with a sinful nature. That's why the Holy Spirit came upon the woman. If Jesus was born via Joseph and Mary, Jesus would have needed Jesus. So Jesus, watch this, so Jesus arrives on the earth scene the same way Adam does, spiritually innocent. And then has the same temptation that Adam does. To do what? To go from spiritually innocent to spiritually perfect. And where Adam fails, Jesus succeeds. Jesus didn't have a sinful nature. Holy Spirit stayed with him the whole three and a half years of his ministry. But for one who's not regenerate, born into sin. Holy Spirit can't dwell on the inside and, and feel and remain, but he can't come upon because we've seen it happen. Would come upon individuals to do, I mean, look at it. It says, his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. That was another common thing. The Spirit of the Lord would descend on the prophets and they would go into prophecy. And here we have a priest prophesying. Saying what? Blesses the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. So this word horn can tell you or point to, to it being a symbolic term of a, of a man. And Daniel prophesies about the little horn. We read about the horns in Revelation as well. We know that that in Daniel 8, the little horn is, is an antichrist. We know that the horn in, in uh, Daniel 7 is the antichrist. Right? A horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness. So here's a scripture that pretty much confirms that holiness and righteousness are two distinctively different things. Before him all the days of our life. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. Remember, Jesus is the son of the highest. John will be the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. John would be the herald, the herald of Jesus. John would be the spokesman, the mouthpiece, paving the way for the coming of the Lord, the first coming, the parousia, by way of birth 
into his earthly ministry, leading up to his earthly ministry. To give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God with which the day spring. Anyone ever heard of day, day spring cards? Like Hallmark cards? That name comes from the scripture here. And it's interesting, this is the only time in scripture where we see this word day spring and literally the word is being applied to Jesus as if this is one of his, like Prince of Peace, like Emmanuel. He's, he's being called here the day spring. It says the day spring from on high. And this word day spring, watch this, it's the same Greek word that we read in Matthew chapter 2 when it says wise men came from the east. That word east, Anatole. The word day spring, Anatole. So it refers to the east, but it can mean the rising of, of the sun and stars, or the east, the direction of the sun's rising. As we have all heard, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Is the sun rising and setting? Not if the earth is rolling around the sun, but that's for those who believe in the spherical earth. For those who believe in the flat earth, they have a different argument. I want to see a flat earther and a spherical earther debate. I just want to see it. I think it would be fun. Which visited the day spring from on high, as, uh, with which the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. That's a long opening chapter, Luke. Chapter 2, verse 1. I remember there are some key things that I wanted you to take note of. One, Zacharias was a priest according to the order of Abiah. And then also, you want to take note of the sixth month. Here's something else you want to pay close attention to. Here it is right here. It says, verse 1 of chapter 2, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Who's Caesar Augustus? This is the first Caesar. Julius Caesar would have been the first Caesar. But during the March of Ides, he was assassinated, led by good old Brutus. And of course, it's one of those things that stick in my head, because I remember seventh grade history class learning about the March of Ides, finding out that Caesar died on March 15th. You know, that's when I was born. <laughs> Caesar, whose political views were, I mean, this is what happens when you have a a, a, a political vanguard, a, 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 a savant, a one whose whose views and 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 ways of thinking are unheard of. Well, they didn't like that, so Caesar was what? Caesar, Caesar they killed him. They assassinated Caesar. Well, Caesar had a great niece and nephew, Octavius and Octavia, and he eventually adopted them as his children. So Octavius, or Octavian, as he was also known, his great nephew became his son, who would then become Caesar Augustus. This is, this is him right here. It came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be, all the world? That means Los Angeles? The known world. Or what? Or the world that Rome owns. The Roman Empire was bigger than the Grecian Empire, which was bigger than the Persian Empire. The world hadn't seen a monster like the Roman Empire. And they were, they were the superpower of the world in this day. And so what does Caesar de decree? That a census, or that the world should be registered. Now it says this census first took, first took place. While what? While... Quirinius was governing Syria. 
Now, we're going to encounter a problem that I believe by the Spirit of God I have solved. Not because I'm special, but because I just keep going until I find. And I'll give you a little bit of it. The events of Luke take place before the events of Matthew. But Herod, who we read about in Matthew, was a ruler and had died before Quirinius ever became the governor of Syria. So here's our potential contradiction. You have the birth events of Luke happening before the birth events of Matthew. Because you'll notice, if you haven't already, that in Luke we read about the babe, but in Matthew we read about the young child. And we're actually able to deduce that Jesus is around two years old when the wise men come to see him because that's why Herod ordered the slaughter of the innocents, all males two years and under. He wanted to make sure that he got Jesus. He wanted to make sure that he got who he believed would be his usurper, even though, Herod, you don't legally have a right to this throne. You're not even, I mean, you're Hebrew, because ultimately your father is Abraham, but you're not Israelite, not a Jew, you're an Edomite. And you're placed here by this heathen power, this Gentile power. So again, the, the events of the life of Jesus that we read about in Luke surrounding his birth and youth, those events happen before the events we read about in Matthew. But the problem is that the figure in leadership in Matthew dies before this man governs Syria. And I, I mean, I've, gone, I've read through so many articles and, and, and research papers and, 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 and swam through books to try to reconcile it. And for the longest, I couldn't reconcile it until I focused on this word that we only see in the New King James Version. If you go to the traditional King James or a number of other versions, it'll read like this, while Quirinius was governor of Syria. But the new King James doesn't word it that way. It says, while governing Syria. Now, this is something else that you want to take note of. All, these, are, these are order of, of Abiah, six month, Quirinius governing Syria. These are the things that we're going to circle back to. But I'll leave you with this before we continue reading. Would you agree or disagree? that you can govern something without being a governor. Because the word govern doesn't limit itself to the position of governor. I govern my home. I'm not a governor. So there is a difference in a man being the governor of a place and a man governing a place. I'm about to go nerd on you right now. Anyone seen the Lord of the Rings? Anyone like me seen the extended versions that reach up to about four hours? No? Okay. All right. Or, and if, you've, if you haven't seen the movies, uh, I mean, uh, odds are slim that you probably read the books because it, the books are, it takes some work. Yeah, it takes some work to get through the books. Okay. I want to focus on one man in particular, whose name was Aragorn, and he was a part of the Fellowship of the Ring, right? and he was, known as, he was known as Strider. This man was actually the heir to the throne of Gondor, but he was out and about doing his own thing because, well, at the time, it's not what he wanted didn't really feel the calling to it. Some other things have factored in. So watch this. While there was no king of Gondor, on the throne sat a steward of Gondor. The steward was not the king, but he was the present governing authoritative figure. 
So you can, you can, you can function or operate in ruling, but not necessarily be a ruler. You can govern without being a governor. Because you can look at it right now. What does it mean to govern? To govern doesn't just mean you're a governor. So that's something else we're going to have to come back to. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Oh, by the way, did you know that Bethlehem wasn't always Bethlehem as we know it? Bethlehem was... Philistinish and Canaanitish, just like Jerusalem. Bethlehem was pagan before it was Jewish, just like Jerusalem. Jerusalem was Canaanite before it was Israelite. And Bethlehem, which means house of bread, didn't always mean house of bread. But it's now been absorbed into the nation of Israel and and then, of course, in previous studies, we learned that actually the land, of, the land that was known as Canaan was land that Canaan stole. He actually stole that land. He stole, that land was Semitic land. And it's interesting how the Canaanites come from Ham, their Hamitic in origin, but they became a Semitic-speaking people. Semitic language. Many Semitic practices. Why? You came from Ham, not Shem. But you took land that belonged to the seed of Shem. And, and it's, I think it's the book of Jubilees where we learn that Canaan took the land by force and a word was given to him. You will lose this land the same way you stole it. And it happened. I told you everything God does is by legality. When God gave Canaan to Israel, all God was doing was restoring and giving back Semitic land to Semites. The Israelites are Semites. Okay, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Doubletree is booked. Marriott has no room. Hilton is a wrap. So where are they? In a, in a manger. The word means manger, crib, or stall. Okay. Elizabeth was six months pregnant when Mary got pregnant. So when Elizabeth was nine months pregnant, ready to deliver, Mary was, well, three months with six months to go. Got six months on the, on the front end, and you got six months, right, on the back end. God's numbering is not coincidental. Verse 8, now there were in the same country. Now here's one of the reasons why some believe, I don't think Jesus was born in December. Because shepherds out in the winter in Palestine? And I can see that. But the shepherds could have wrapped up. It's colder, get warmer. That's what we do. Whether it's a California winter Winters which those in like the Midwest would laugh at and probably call a summer and say, y'all don't know what winter is. But if we were to travel to the Midwest during winter, wouldn't we dress appropriately? We would. So I can't necessarily say that this is an automatic guarantee that he wasn't born in the month we call December. I'm not ruling it out. I'm just saying it could be. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Notice it says living, living out. What does living out mean? Sounds to me like it means living. It literally means in the Greek, 
to live in the fields. So if you're living in the fields, you're prepared for all seasons. That's where you're living. It says, Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sorely or greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. See, true angel of God, a true angel of the Lord uses words like this. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe. A what? A babe. Wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, what did this sound like? Heavenly hosts way up in the heavens. A choir that filled the night sky. I wish I could have heard it. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. They, the angels clearly have emotions. They're excited. They're rejoicing. At, watch this, at the birth of a Savior who would save mankind by offering salvation to mankind, which the Bible says things angels desire to look into. Angels are, are curious about the salvation experience. It says, so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Who came to see the babe? Shepherds. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. It's the only time you'll see the word child here. But child doesn't mean, doesn't mean child in the way it means in Matthew. Child in this sense means it doesn't matter how old you are. Like I'm 45 years old, about to be 45 years old. I'm still my mother's child. I'm a grown man, but I'm my mother's child. Because I came from the womb of Betty. I'm her child. And always will be. That's what this word means here. Your babe is your child. Your 10-year-old is your child. Your teenager is your child. Your young adult is your child. Your old adult is your child. But this is a babe that the shepherds came to see. It says, and all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen as it was told them. Now, when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. This is, this is tradition. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two pigeons. We're going to end right here. Watch this. What determined whether you offered turtle doves or whether you offered pigeons? Say it again. Talk to me. Your wealth, your, 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 your status. Were you rich? Were you wealthy? Were, were you poor? The pigeons was, a, was an offering from the poor. So it tells us at this point in Joseph and Mary's life, they, there's a bit of a struggle here financially. They couldn't offer the turtle doves. They offered the pigeons. Okay, watch this. Or I believe it's the turtle doves or pigeons are the offering, are the impoverished offering. And I, I think maybe it's, I'll, I'll have this information accurate for you. Matter of fact, let me read you this here in the ESV. Uh, yeah, turtle doves or pigeons indicated, indicated the poverty offering, those turtle doves or pigeons. I can't, I'll remember what the, what the offering of the rich would be. I don't know if it was 
dove doves or, or something else. But turtle doves or pigeons, if, if they were offered, then that, that, that was an indicator of your means in life. Now watch this. Who did the shepherds see? They saw the babe. Now, have you ever seen images? It's 2024, and we still see them. You still see images of the shepherds there at the manger, and the wise men are there at the manger. Wise men never seen the inn or the manger because they never saw the babe. They saw the young child. They didn't see the babe newly born. They saw a two-year-old. And watch this. When Jesus was born, they were poor. By the time the wise men showed up and offered gold, wasn't poor no more. Not receiving gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And it wasn't just three wise men, was it? No. And this is what we'll, we'll, we'll hit in Matthew. In Matthew, we read about the young child. We read about Herod, the slaughter of the innocents the gifts by the Magi brought to Christ. Father, we thank you for your word. It's life is truth. It will not, it cannot return to you void, but it will accomplish what it's set out to do. It will prosper where it's sent. And I thank you that the word has gone forth. The seed has been sown into our hearts, and it will produce in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, that your word be. It will not return to you useless or empty, it produces, you send it forth to accomplish, and where you send it, you intend for it to prosper. Thank you for your accomplished and prospering word having gone forth this evening. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for making the invitations I'll mention in just a second available to the people, both wherever they are streaming from and in person. If you don't know Jesus, so we were talking about tonight, the birth of our Savior. The Bible says God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Only way you can be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth is by way of Jesus. You can be saved today. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's being born again, born from above, born of the Spirit of God. If you are born of the Spirit of God, you then qualify for invitation number two, which is to be filled. We, we read about Zacharias and, and Elizabeth and John being filled with the Spirit, but they were not filled with the Spirit in the manner in which we, on this side of the cross, can be filled with the Spirit. The Jerusalem church, the first believers, could not go into the world and preach the gospel until they were endued with power from on high. And they obeyed and they waited in Jerusalem, in the upper room. They were filled with the Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's the initial sign that one is filled. There are other indicators that one is filled with the Holy Spirit. The only requirement, again, is that you're saved, that you're born of the Spirit. Both being saved or being filled with the Spirit are simple acts of faith. Asking the Father, meaning saying or calling for. And if you're not filled, you can be filled today. It's, it's truly the only way to live the full life that Jesus desires us to live while we're on the earth. Number three is to become a part of this local assembly, local community of believers, whether in person or, or online, if you're not a part of a family of faith. You didn't tune in. You didn't show up here this evening by accident. God is a God of purpose. And lastly, assurance of salvation. God wants you to know without a doubt. As well as I know, I'm, 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 my name is Frederick. I was born March 15, 1979. As well as I know that, I can know I'm saved. You can know you're saved. Again, those sort of be saved, to be filled with the Spirit, to make this ministry, your home for assurance of salvation. If you want any one of these or combination of these apply to you, wherever you're seated in this place, raise your hand. Wherever you're seated or standing or driving or wh wherever you are, where I cannot see you, still raise that hand up because we're going to pray together in just a moment. Praise God. I don't see any hands in person. We want to make sure we cover you all. I'm going to ask for everyone to repeat after me. 
the simple prayer of salvation and a simple prayer to receive the gift of the Spirit. This will also cover you if you aren't sure of your salvation. You'll, you'll be sure after we pray this. For salvation, simply say, Dear God, Dear God. I repent of my sins. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, and I believe in my heart that you've raised him from the dead. I am now saved in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. To be filled with the Spirit, simply repeat after me, saying, Heavenly Father, by faith, I receive the gift of the Spirit. I am now filled with the Spirit. I have received my heavenly language. But most importantly, I am now a witness for the King and Kingdom in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. If you prayed these prayers to our online audience for the very first time, you are in the family of God. You can be sure you're saved. And, and, and you're filled with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. If you have questions now, what to do next, or questions about becoming a part of our ministry, via online. The email address you see on the screen before you is how you can reach out to us. Now, anyone in person? No hands were raised earlier? I don't want to make an assumption that everyone is saved and filled with the Spirit. We just prayed prayers. Um, maybe you prayed these for the first time. Okay. Even though I know all these faces in here are saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. So praise God for that. All right, well, it's time to give. It's time to sow. And it's time to sow cheerfully, and excitedly, and happily, and hilariously. It's the only way we give, the only way we should be giving. If we're not giving any other, or if we are giving any other way, then we shouldn't be giving. Because God loves a cheerful giver. All right, not, not I have a need. Oh, I got a need. Okay, right? Have a need, sow a seed. It rhymes, it sounds good. Yeah, it should work. No, not of necessity. Because again, what will occur? You have a need, so now I'll sow in order to receive based on my need. Oh, but I don't have any need, so no need to sow. No, not just out of necessity. And then grudgingly, that's even worse in my opinion. You're just ugly acting about giving. Like, why would you even, like, can you imagine? Like, Merry Christmas here, take this. <laughs> Happy birthday. Ugh, like, I don't want this. I don't care if it was something I wanted. I now don't want it. Please keep it. Delivery is important. All right? The message you send. What's God saying? Hey, hey, if it, you're not happy about this, keep it. Because, you know, God's already saying what? I don't need your money. This is, this is for my kingdom in the earth, and this is to benefit you. So, and when we sow, we reap, and we'll reap in due season. If we faint not, do not lose heart. We are not, we are not of those who draw back. We are not those who grow weary in good deeds. If you're ready to give, let's lift our gifts up, or if you're just showing your agreement, and lift our hands up to our great high priest, I'll pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to sow towards what you're doing in the earth realm. We count it always an honor and privilege to be what you call us fellow workers, fellow laborers that are going forth into the plentiful harvest, spreading the message of our living Savior, seeing to it that that message goes forth into this dying world. And I thank you that as we give this day, according to what we have as we purpose in our heart, doing so cheerfully, that we will reap the corresponding manifold return on our giving in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. So, Father, we, we rejoice with all those who have received their healing. If there were those in pain, dealing with any kind of heaviness, and upon prayer at the beginning or throughout the word going forth, the pain left. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. The heaviness lifted. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. We, 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 we rejoice with them, but we stand in agreement with anyone who has yet to see the manifestation. By faith, they will receive if... They believe they receive when we prayed. I thank you right now as we're praying, they're believing that they receive. And we know that we will receive what we prayed for, Father, because we prayed according to your will.
we have asked according to your will. Therefore, we know you hear us. And therefore, we know we have the petition that we've asked of you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for your healing power filling this place, spirit, soul, and body, and for filling the homes and workplaces and wherever else our viewers may be. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Before we get into Q&A, a few things. Thank you to those who donated blood on Sunday. The Red Cross is grateful but still has an emergency need for blood donors. If you can donate on Tuesday, February 13th, please register today by downloading the blood donor app, going to redcross.org or calling 1-800-RED-CROSS. Tomorrow night, intercessory prayer will be in this room, 7.30 p.m. And until then, continue to have the best week of your life. In the name of the Lord Jesus, so for those who are departing now, for those who are logging off now, we will see you on Sunday. For those who are remaining, Q&A shall start right now. Pigeons. Of a lamb. Right. No status no distinction. Leviticus. Interesting. Leviticus 15 and Leviticus 5. Okay, I'll read those. Because I remember I, 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 just, I remember a conversation that I had with a buddy of mine, and we were, you know, we were talking about, you know, rich Jesus, poor Jesus, or whatever in between. And um and he made mention of the, the turtle dove and young pigeon offering, which was for the impoverished. And many commentaries say that. They could be. Leviticus 5 as a replacement for a lamb if you can't afford it. Mm. Leviticus 15, there is no distinction. If you have a child, you give two turtle doves or. Oh, yeah, see. See, that's what I love about. Um, what's I love about the word? Like it's just you can know something or even think you know something for so long, and then you you see. I mean, the book really is alive. It truly is. I was raised Catholic. My family is still Catholic. Growing up, I had so many questions. No one could help me. As an adult, I began reading the Bible. Was led to CCC. I was born again. Thirteen years now. I cannot tell you how many. accounts I've heard, my, my, my parents have heard, our family has heard about, about people who were Catholic. And literally, they worded like this, I used to be Catholic, but now I'm saved. Which means they knew when they were Catholic, based on now being saved, they knew that when they were Catholic, they weren't saved. Now, I, I, I have encountered... I mean, it, it, because Catholics do recognize Jesus as, as the way, you know, the problem is everything else that surrounds it. So I, I believe that there are, and I've heard this term before, Catholic Christians. Right? You're, you're, you believe in Jesus. You have confessed and you believe he is Savior. God raised him from the dead. He is the way to the Father. But you still subscribe to all the, the other extra things. So prayer for them that they would, would uh, um, you know, get free from that stuff. Can you teach about the Yule customs associated with Christmas? Oh, yeah, we're going to Yule. We're going to talk about Yule. You'd be surprised the many things associated with Yule. Oh, I want to share some with you right now. But, yeah, tune in for that. We're going to talk about Yule. Scandinavian uh, winter festival and 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 rituals question pastor what month do you feel Jesus was born in so I'm going to give you my I'm going to give you the answer that will make you tune in every week Jesus was born in May September or December May September or December 
again. When was it? Hmm? When was it? May, September, or December. Oh, one of those three. One of those three. Okay. I'm going to make a case. Okay. So the, the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to first make a case for May. Then I'm going to make a case for December. Then I'm going to make a case for September. Right. All right, then we're going to back, back up, look at all the evidence, right. see, what we, see what we land on. Again, my recommendation, let's celebrate in all three months. A try Christmas. Yes, sir. Come to the mic. Yeah. So we can all hear your, your question. And while you make your way, salvation and healing happens at the same time. A amen. I was raised Catholic as well. Became Christian in my teens. Urban. Wow, didn't know that. That is... Impressive again, how many times we hear that. Yes, please come. Is that a uh, Tampa, oh, Tampa Bay? I see. Tampa oh, Bay hat, uh, Tampa Bay jacket. Huh? Yes, sir. Are you okay? Yeah. You're, you're good? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, one, of the reason, one of the things I think people put the emphasis on Mary is because who is worthy to carry somebody holy mm -hmm. as the Lord? Yeah. So they put this kind of, and I don't want you to hear this the wrong way, but it's kind of like your mother. She's the matriarch, matriarch of this family and of this because of what your father did. Now, but you're the pastor. Yeah. So that mantle of anointing has been passed down from his life onto your life. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why they put the emphasis onto her. And even, even though she's, there's no power, she just carried him. But who's worthy? And she and the and like it says, is blessed art thou among yeah. women. Yeah. So that's. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. Yeah. I, I just I, I. I just, I don't see how. I mean, I literally subscribe to what you just said. I, I think we all feel that way about Mary. Blessed is she. But. She was. She was a human woman born into sin, just like everyone else. So the Catholic route of, of how venerated she is, it's, it's like I heard one say, why, why do people judge us? Like, isn't it okay for, for us to just like appreciate, you know, the mother of our Lord? Oh, absolutely. But not in praying to her, right? Not in, not in, not in worshiping her. I mean, and you think about it, you, you got to think about it in Catholicism, like, okay, God is God. And Jesus is Jesus, but I'm telling you, Mary and the Pope, they up there. I mean, the Pope, for all intents, is, the, is God in the earth. But again, he's fallible. That's why Jesus would have never built his... See, they believed that Peter was the first Pope and that Jesus built his church on Peter. So Peter was the first Pope, and then we go down this line, and we reach the Pope that we have today. And that pope is viewed the same way Peter was viewed, but they were fallible men, fallible men. So I just believe that's the, you know, the adversary just got in there and, and subtly and seductively inspired these practices that, that from the outside looking in, they seem holy. I mean, and not only praying to Mary, but praying to saints and praying to angels. We don't see that in the scripture. And then again, saints are, are, are vaulted above regular Catholics. But, it, but from a biblical perspective, based on what the Word says, all believers are saints. We're all saints. Uh, saint Patrick was no more saint than you or I. Right? Saint Nicholas was no more saint than you or I. Saint Valentine was no more saint than you or I, if you're a believer in the Lord. But you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that's what it is. And I just think the adversary was able to use that, like, oh, they're going to really put an emphasis on Mary because she carried the Savior. So now, and then again, because of so many pagan practices that, that, that Constantine funneled through Christianity, and you had all of these previous female mother goddess figures that were like the, 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 the goddess, the queen of heaven. And then that was brought over to Mary. I concur reading the Price Study Bible. I have a cough. Oh, Church of the Harvest, Spirit-Filled Life Bible by Bishop Clarence McClendon. And it's really good, but a Price Bible <laughs> would be supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. I, I, 
I want to do it. I want to do it. It's going to, it's going to take me some time because it's going to be, y'all know how, you know how my brain works. So that, but it is something that I want to do. I truly do. So I'm not sure, but it is not mentioned that Jesus' disciples ah, were baptized. Also, how did they know him that when he said to them to follow him, they got up and went without question? Well, I mean, based on what we see in the scripture, he, he, he chose them. Well, let's deal with the baptism part first. Um, yeah, let's see, what do we read about any of them being baptized? I don't, I don't know if there's anything specific about the 12 being baptized off the top of my head. I believe it's safe to assume they were baptized with water based on preaching it. Why would you preach or teach about water baptism and then you yourself don't be baptized or don't get baptized in water? Again, because the Bible is, is full of life and it's constantly giving birth to, to new illuminations. And it's not that anything is hidden. It's just you, you haven't seen it yet. So as I'm just replaying what I do remember about Acts, I mean, the eunuch was baptized. We read about Paul was baptized, right? Don't we read that? He, we read that he's filled with the Spirit. We know he got saved. Why do I feel like, is that Acts 9 or 11? I might be wrong. But, but, but Paul teaches it. He teaches about the baptism. So clearly he had to be baptized with water or baptized in water. Um, Peter preaches it. So if they're preaching it, most likely they would have subscribed. to. They, they would have been uh, uh, their best candidates to adhere to what they were, what they were speaking. Yeah, that's what? Nine, I thought so. 913. So, again, there's no way Paul's baptized and Peter and John aren't. So, we, listen, as students of the Word and led by the Holy Spirit, we are able to make some deductions in Scripture and, and able to... I like to say safely assume certain things about Scripture, even though it's not written. Just like we've heard numerous times. Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. But he does define marriage. Matthew 19. And he defines it as it was in the beginning, male and female. So, again, we could make a case for what else was implied there, even though he was only talking about divorce. The fact is, he defines marriage from the beginning. That's just an example of, of deductions that can be, I call, they're the safe ones, based on what is written. Uh, Mark, let's see. Um, all right, so in Mark's account, see, Matthew's not in chronological order. Uh, but in Mark's account, all right, we get a quick run through John the Baptist preparing the way, baptizing Jesus, temptation in the wilderness, and then his ministry beginning. And so here, I mean, first chapter, right? Verse 16, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. Now, if this is all you have to go by, how do you answer that question? What was it about him that they just stopped what they did and followed him? Let's see. And this is why he said it, disciples of John first. This is why I have always taught that the moment John baptized Jesus in water, the Spirit of God came upon Jesus, 
And after his 40 days, John the Baptist, sir, you have no more disciples. You and your disciples are now his disciples. So, and then also take into consideration that the, the prophets spoke of this man. They spoke of him to come. And it shows you how a microcosm, and that's what we have today, a smaller amount of Israel accepts him, a greater amount rejects him. And we also know that the 12 disciples make up or represent the 12 tribes. That microcosm, that small number that would accept him, that would move in faith as opposed to rejecting him. So, so you've got the prophets, of what they spoke about the coming Messiah, what John the Baptist was already preaching. And then that, that remember, John, he prepared the way. He prepared the way. Um, anyone ever heard of the Silver Surfer? Comic book figure. Com Silver, Surfer, Silver Surfer was known as the Herald of Galactus. Right? Galactus was a planet-eating god. And Silver Surfer would come to a planet first. Right? He'd scout that planet, and he let all on the planet know Galactus is coming. So in that same vein, except it wasn't for destruction, it was for life. But John the Baptist is preparing the way. Listen, there's somebody coming. Yeah, I baptize you in water, but there's one coming whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to, worthy to loose. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So that would have prepared these disciples who were John's disciples or familiar with the ministry of John. Oh, there he is. He's the one. That's him. Matter of fact, I saw him get baptized in water. And then this, something happened in the sky. The Spirit came and descended upon him. So, yeah. And now they're, now they're flooding in. Okay, that question needs to be finished. It's interesting that Elizabeth is of the daughters of Aaron, Levi, and Mary is of the daughters, ultimately, of Judah, yet they are related, probably to their mothers. Yeah. Hi, Pastor. Was the Gospel of John written to everyone, bearing in mind the other three had a specific audience? Not everyone, everyone else. John's Gospel who presents John as the son of God, it's not synoptic, was for the rest of the Gentiles. The rest of the Gentiles. Let's see. Uh, here's wifey doing a little bit of research or sending me some research. Right, the, the pigeons and doves represent, doves were more than just a... a trope for lament over broken relationships with God. They were an instrument of atonement. In Hebrew tradition, the dove was clean according to Mosaic law and sacrifice and rituals of expiation, especially by the poor. But that's, again, now we're going to have to, we got to uh, interrogate Leviticus. What do, you, what do you think that the purpose that God, what do you think the purpose that God gave me free will? And do you believe that we are test that we are tested? Or let me reword it, seeing how we handle free will? Uh, I mean, I, I believe the main reason is that God wants to be chosen. Not, not create followers that he forces or makes to love him. God, 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 God wants his creation to choose, to choose life, to choose him, to choose salvation, to choose right. And again, what would be the purpose of creation or creating man without free will? What are we, what are, what are we then doing? I, I, I mean, that's... This guy's just like he's bored, he wants to play with some toys. I, I mean, no. So ultimately, it's, it's to choose him. Do you believe that we're tested? No, I don't, I don't see that as a, I don't see it as a test. I see the devil testing us in it. 
I see God proving us in it. So. During Jesus' life, did you ever wonder what was going on in the other parts of the world? Absolutely. I read one time that he had appeared to others around the world. I've read some things like that. Here's the reality. We don't know. We don't have a record of 18 years. Now, I can only speak from silence I, because there's nothing in Scripture about it. But there had to be some kind of preparation. I think there had to be some kind of increase in earthly knowledge, I would think. Um, I, I actually like the mystery of not knowing. Like, ooh, what was happening for 18 years? That's a long time. It's a long time to get smart. It's a long time to increase in knowledge and understanding. But, um, I mean, I don't rule out the things that could have happened in that, in that 18 years. Um, history tells us that older religions like Buddhism had missionaries in Judea. The same way we as believers send out missionaries to nations to preach the message of the cross. Buddhism dates back to before Christ. And so there were the Buddhist, Buddhist missionaries. Come on up, man. We'll end with, we'll end with you. Let's see. This is an interesting thought. Jesus is king by way of Judah and priest by way of Levi. Right. I mean, that's, that's the, the writer of Hebrews is, is in awe. Like he is, he's in awe of the fact that Jesus is from the tribe of Judah and he's a priest. He distinctly ma makes note that um, the priests come from Levi and Jesus, come, Jesus comes from Judah. Um, that's, an inter that's an interesting thought, though. But his order is not Levitical. It's Melchizedekian. Jesus went to temple to pray on his 12th birthday around Passover time. Is that a statement or a question? Um, looks like a statement. Okay. Oh, and then didn't his disciples baptized? So again, you're not baptizing unless you believe in baptism and therefore have been baptized. Yeah. Okay, go for it. Uh, you just mentioned somebody said, um, "Does Jesus test?" I believe that. He allows us to be field tested. And with the field testing, that proves to us who we really are. He knows because he's omniscient. Right. He knows our end before I begin. We know that. But he allows us to be field tested. You went through some field testing. Your mother is going through some field testing. Uh, field testing is of the Lord. Why? Because what that does, it, it teaches, it shows us where our faith is in him. Um, all throughout the Bible, those who were called by his name, or it's, the Bible is inundated with people that were called by his name that were field tested. Noah was field tested. Job was, was field tested. Abraham field tested. Yeah. All these people field tested and passed. The rich young ruler failed his field testing, but yet was field tested. Mm -hmm. And I believe the, the rich young ruler is a capitulation of us, the church, because we all come to the temple every Sunday and wait dutifully to get up in here to worship God. And when he, as you know the story, when he knew that Jesus was in close proximity where his location was, he came, the Bible said he came running, kneeling down in his presence. And he says, good master, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus asked a question. He wasn't flattered by his eloquent speech because when he said it, he said, he, I believe he said it eloquently. He says, why do you call me good? So now I'm, I'm exercising, what, what is Jesus doing? I'm exercising my omniscience. I'm understanding why you're coming. I already understand why you're coming. Why do you call me good? Mm -hmm. I know I'm good. 
He says, no one but good, but one that's God. But he was God. He says, another scripture, pastor scripture, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Oh, for he and I are all one. So he knew he was good. But so I believe that field testing is of the Lord. And the, what is the prerequisite of field testing? You have to be in his will. What's, what's the purpose of being field tested if you're not in the will of the Lord? There's no purpose because you're in sin. So Satan's not going to worry about you. Mm -hmm. But when you're of doing the will of God, the enemy attacks your back and your body. That's field testing. Why? Because you're in his will. Your, your mother is going through right now because she's in his will. That's the prerequisite. Uh, Noah, uh, I'm sorry, Job was in his will. He, as you taught, you taught that a few weeks ago. He was not like a man, like any other man, mm -hmm. but he was in his will. And he, he was very richly abundant. God allowed Satan to come and he destroyed his kids, his cattle, his flock. Everything that he had was destroyed, but then he was replenished all that twice, doubly, no. okay, double mm -hmm. for his trouble. So field testing is of the Lord. And that goes not only for years, but for the house. If you're tried by the Lord, by, by, by Satan, know that God is allowing that for a specific purpose because you're in his will. That's the prerequisite for being field tested for the, for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's all I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, like, I like your wording, field tested. Um, again, I see... Now, I, I believe there is the devil's and, I, and I, I've heard a lot of people teach this, that you know, the devil can only do what, the, what God allows him. However, Jesus is very clear that he has his own kingdom and he has his own resources, which means he has his own agenda, which means that there, there are things that the devil is, is setting out to do that, that is in direct opposition to what God mm -hmm. has planned. And so I believe there are tests that come from that, that space, from his own resources. Scripture uh, concerning Job or anybody, uh, right? And, and I'm and so what I'm talking about is different than that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, whereas with with the Lord, I've always looked at it like this. I figure, what's the best way for me to understand my relationship with my earthly father than to get an understanding of my relationship with my heavenly father? Because my my heavenly father, our heavenly father, is the best example of a father there is. Mm -hmm. So. In some ways, I'm able to understand the ways of God via the ways of my father, who, of course, for me, and should be for any child, the closest thing to God, you know, in the earth realm. And so I think of some things that my father allowed me to go through, my earthly father allowed me to go through. In other words, it was something that he had the power to stop, but he didn't. And so I see God's proving in that same vein, because, and I used to, I'm telling you, I used to be one to think, you don't need to go through stuff to learn something. All you need is his word. No, you need to be placed in situations where you apply the word. Right. And, and, and it wasn't until I found myself in certain situations where I'm like, oh, and then coming out on the other side of it, it's like, wow, I did learn something that I would not have learned had it have just been my eyes and my mouth seeing the word and speaking the word. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some things that, that the reality is it's healthy, uh, healthy for us to go through them. So once again, I look back at things that my father could have fixed, but he didn't, and I'm glad he didn't. Right. I'm glad he allowed me. He didn't cause it, but he allowed me to go through it mm -hmm. and look at the sparkling diamond or gem that came out on the other side. However... I do believe mm -hmm. that the devil, because of his own agenda, mm -hmm. we know that God allows the adversary to do thus and so, mm -hmm. but he is an opponent of God mm -hmm. and therefore an opponent of us. Yeah, yeah. and so I've, again, when Jesus, John 8, he says he's a liar, he, li he said from his own resources, he's got his own resources, he's got his own kingdom, his own devices and his own schemes. So he's got his own agenda, and he is working his 
agenda. And the reason why he's working his agenda is because he doesn't know all things like God knows all things. So. But the, the Bible is, is recording that they have conversation. Like the scripture said, God asked him, he said, have you considered my servant Job? Right. So if they have a conversation, you would think the way it's taught, okay, they're against one another. Why would you even, why would you even want to tantalize a conversation with somebody that you're against? I mean, you don't have fellowship. It's like almost having fellowship. But they're not, ha they don't have fellowship. But they, they were, the Bible says, like, like I just said, like, and you've read it. Hey, he, hey, have you considered my servant Joe? Yeah, I have, but you got a hedge of protection around him, and I guarantee you, move that hedge of protection. He's going to curse you to your face. Sure. He's going to do this, 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 and that, and the other. And, they, and God, of, of course, him being omniscient, no, he's not. He's going to do everything, everything. He, he already knew. So then he said, let the test happen, and it happened. Now, again, Job is, Job's an anomaly. Uh, he really is. I, I really believe that's what the Bible says. He looked on the earth and he found none like him. And this might even, <laughs> this might even seem kind of harsh, but I mean, Job was like, it's like an, I don't want to say it, an experiment. <laughs> that's not the word that I want to use, but his situation is so rare. His conversations, the conversations that Job has with God, or the encounters that he has with God, you don't find anywhere else in Scripture. You don't find God as Eloah, except in the book of Job, which is the singular for Elohim. The Elohim, everywhere else in the Old Covenant. But in the book of Job, it's the only place in Scripture where we find him as, as Eloah. So I, I think there's something, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm still massaging it and seeing what else is there, but there's something very unique about, about Job as it relates to others who went through trials, as it relates to others who went through, through, through tests. And then in the New Testament, we were reading, you were here that it was like the last service, the last, sorry, the last, um, before you, before the, we took the break. But Satan went to Jesus and was inquired about Peter. And then Jesus comes to Peter and says, Satan, has desired to sift you mm -hmm. as a wheat, but I'm mm -hmm. praying that your faith would not fail. So, you see, see that's, have, that's that's really they a have good. interaction with one another. Right, but that's a good example mm -hmm. of 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 Satan mm -hmm. having an agenda for Peter, with Jesus saying, "But I desire, but it's like my strong hope, even though he's omniscient and, mm -hmm. and has foreknowledge and knows what the end's going to be, but mm -hmm. my desire is that you, Peter, do thus and so. And so, uh, to me, that's another classic case of, of where God is allowing something that he could fix based on his ability, but I believe would be a violation of his integrity. And so he allows this to happen. He knows what the end will be. He knows, he knows what it would be if we apply, he knows what the end result will be if we don't apply, because he knows all things. But again, the purpose should be some kind of positive gain out of whatever trial that the Lord allows us to go through. Yeah. Yeah. All right. They're probably mad online, like, Pastor, all these other questions, and you... Let me see. I think... I can run through them quickly. Question, Pastor, help me understand about baptism. Is it true if you're baptized in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit, you aren't really saved? I heard you have to be in the name of Jesus only. So the question that I would follow this with is, which baptism are you talking about? If you're talking about water baptism, Water baptism can't save you. To truly be saved is to go, is to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God's raised him from the dead. Uh, he who believes in me will never die, Jesus said. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to who, so that whoever believes him will not perish but have everlasting life. Salvation is acquired by way of Jesus, believing on Jesus, confessing Jesus, Water baptism 
I don't, I mean, Mark talks about being baptized in the name of, of the Father, Son, and Spirit, but you don't see that repeated all throughout Acts or the New Testament. So I believe ultimately the most, most important um, the most important name to speak, and because this is what Jesus teaches us, is the name of Jesus. And the reality is, I mean, if the Father, Son, and the Spirit are one and the same, then in saying the name of Jesus during someone's baptism is including the Father and Spirit as well. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a big deal. I don't think it affects your baptism, whether you baptize as you're immersing them in water in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, or if it's just in the name of Jesus. Because again, baptism can't save you. It's something that should happen, but it's not necessary for your salvation. Pastor, when God says my people perish because of a lack of knowledge, is this meaning Christians that don't know their rights or unbelievers, meaning dying or dead spiritually? Also, did you journey to, I think you're asking if I journeyed to Bethlehem. I have, I have been to Bethlehem. Um, so God was speaking through the prophet Hosea to his people, Israel. And so contextually, it wasn't referring to the church, but it can be applied in that my people are destroyed for, you know, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ can be destroyed or hurt or harmed because of a lack of knowledge. Uh, but that specifically was to Israel. It didn't have anything to do with unbelievers. Uh, John was baptized in water. Uh, did we just read that in Luke? Were the heavens open after John was baptized? I don't, I don't remember that. Jesus, but not. If, so if you, if you meant Jesus, then the, que the answer to why is because he's Jesus. Um, I'm going to assume you mean Jesus. Okay. There's conversion. Sample of how... Okay. These are, these are pretty much been answered. Oh, okay. You did mean Jesus. Got it. All right, I think that's all. Pastor, did you say you'll be teaching more in depth about Catholicism? Yep, at some point I will. Hi, Pastor, do you know, this is the last one, do you know a scripture that speaks uh, specifically to punishment for cruelty of animals? I can't think of one. I would imagine if there is one, it would probably be in Leviticus. But I can't think of one off the top of my head. Uh, no, that wouldn't be. I mean, that is cruelty to animals. It, it really is. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, this, the scripture's clear about that. But cruelty to animals? I mean, if it's in there, I wouldn't be surprised. But I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Uh, but I would guess it would be somewhere. I would think Leviticus first, maybe Numbers, maybe Deuteronomy, but. Ah, uh, and the donkey. Yeah. Both of them and yeah, I don't think I would use that one either. Uh, that was such a specific account, and it was ultimately about getting Balaam's attention. So, but like as a, as a was there a law given to Israel about cruelty to animals? Like I said, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, so let's stand. Father, we thank you for this time, uh, this time of gathering and, and fellowship. We thank you for your grace and, and protection that covers us always. And we thank you for your angels that you've given charge over us to protect us from all hurt, harm, and danger. And we thank you for them as being ministering spirits, ready to minister for us, we the heirs of salvation, because they heed the voice of your word. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. We'll see you next time.